the Royal Society wanted to look at population again as a topic. It's been off the agenda for too long. For the last 20 years or so, it's been a bit of a hot potato. I was invited to chair it because I'm not an expert in demography or sociology or any of the fields involved. We have a very broad working group of people who are 22 strong, international, from all over the world, developing and developed countries, broad range of expertise. We have this big working group. I'm the chair and I'm interested in the topic, but not, uh, as I say, expert in any aspect of it. We very quickly found that we weren't just going to do a report on population, but on population and consumption, because the top message in a way of the report is that these two can't be separated. It's the, it's the um, impact on the planet we're looking at, the impact on the environment, and of course, therefore, on human well-being. Uh, and it's, it's due to the combination of the rising number of people and the rising per capita consumption of each one of us. And we, um, why now? Well, we are actually reaching a critical period in the, in the history of the Earth and the history of humanity. We are now, visibly even, not just in models, affecting the environment. We're melting Arctic ice, for example, to an unprecedented extent. It's all going rather faster than the models predicted. We are extinguishing species at a rate which is unprecedented for probably hundreds of millions of years, certainly tens of millions. We are producing a great catastrophe for other species in terms of extinction. And people have called it, in fact, we are entering the Anthropocene, where people control the planet. So it's certainly a moment when the Royal Society should get involved. But it's putting, it's really putting the numbers on, which was striking to me, you know, just how many species are going dead, for example. One thing which I wasn't aware of, again, it's partly a matter of numbers, is the inequality in the world. I mean, I knew that the rich nations were richer than the poor nations and so on. I wasn't really realising that the per capita energy use in the richest countries is 50 times, on average, that in the poorest countries. And for individuals, of course, the spread is much wider. The same story goes right across. It's not true of food because that takes us outside the range <laughs> of what you can eat. But on the other hand, the sort of food, meat eating, for example, you see similar ratios. You see these similar ratios in use of minerals and the use of water. And these are very, very big factors. And one of the, one of the things we came to, we, we discussed very carefully, well, one could envisage, I suppose, a world going forward where these sorts of inequalities persist. And sadly, under business as usual, we, they are persisting and indeed getting worse. But we, and it turns out I think more, almost everybody says this is wrong. We cannot have a world with this level of inequality. But then of course, there's an added problem for us. Not only do we have to sort of deal with the population and consumption and the impact on the planet in some way, but also we're trying to free up, uh, we're trying to even up the inequality. So it's a, it's, a, it's a double whammy, really, of what needs to be done. We're saying there are, we officially classified 1.3 billion people in the world as being in dire poverty. That means they're malnourished, basically. Uh, quite a good fraction of those are actually starving. Um, and so that needs to be dealt with. They need to be lifted out of poverty. But that means more consumption for them. We can only imagine that happening if somehow or another we reduce consumption by the rich countries. Everybody says, impossible. However, of course, what we're talking about, bear in mind, is not economic consumption necessarily, although that's usually tied to material consumption, but material consumption. It's material consumption that uses up the water and the minerals and produces carbon dioxide. And there's no reason in principle why we should not dematerialize our economies, maintain the same standard of living, or better, and yet reduce the throughput of materials. And in fact, when you look at, the, at what different countries are doing, and you compare, for example, North America with Japan, and then you, you find that you have comparable standards of living with very much lower throughput in the, in the Japanese case. And there are many other examples as well. The UK is somewhere in between. A number of the Scandinavian countries are, are like Japan. So it can be done. And if you dematerialize in this way, then it makes room for the others to, to, to move up. So that's our second recommendation. Let's take this seriously. Let's do it. This is not just a, a mantra for, for politicians to spout, saying green economy. This is real. This is essential 
for the survival of humanity on the earth. And the third thing is that we do really, to avoid an endlessly moving target, have to, have, to, have to bite the bullet and say population growth should slow and eventually flatten, preferably in this century. We should not go on increasing forever. At the moment, the UN projections give quite a wide range. It's all under human volition, after all, how many, how many children we have. At the moment, although many countries have reduced their fertility to at or below replacement, some have not, and we think this is something that should be talked about quite openly as being desirable. And it's desirable for the people doing it. It's not something that's being imposed from outside, but the, the most fertile countries are also the poorest, and they are suffering from excessive youth dependency. So those would be our, our sort of top recommendations, and I would preface them all, and, and we could talk more about the others, but I think it's better to look at the report for that detail, by saying this is about human flourishing. This is not about imposing a something or other from above. This is saying if humanity is going to flourish, then we have to do these things. And we have to tie them together with a lot of threads. We have to tie them together with the, with the threads of education for all. We have to tie them together with health care for all, and that includes family planning, freely available, for example, to the 200 million women who at the moment do not have access to the contraception they want. And we have to tie it together with the thread of economics. And that again is quite a difficult one because I think uh, it, most economists sort of feel that the free market system, it's all going fine and, 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 and we measure everything with GDP. These things are not going all that fine. We actually need f better measures than GDP that take into account natural capital, human well-being, and somehow really incorporate them into a trading system. And this amounts really to, to quite seriously um, changing the, or overhauling, I should say, the, the economic system of the world. So that's quite a hefty shopping list, but those are the ways we have to go if we want to flourish. I have to be optimistic because this is the future of humanity, and, but we have to work to make our optimism come about.